In Hiroshima, a day or two later, with an army investigation team headed by Lieutenant General Seizo Arisui, chief of the 2nd Bureau, intelligence of the Army General Staff, Nishina learned that three more parachutes had come down near Hiroshima and that a Navy group had checked them out. They were carrying a sort of barometer, fitted with an electric wave transmitter. He believed that Americans at distant bases were able to pick up these electric waves, thus calculating the changes in atmospheric pressure caused by the explosion. Writing his report by candlelight at the Ujima Shipping Command outside the danger zone, Arisue included this note. Rumour has it that the same kind of bomb will be dropped on Tokyo on 12 August. But the next bomb did not fall on Tokyo, and it fell before the 12th. The victim was Nagasaki. Unfortunately for it, the primary target had been Kokura. But smoke so hid that city that the attackers abandoned the attempt and headed for Nagasaki, the secondary target. As with Hiroshima, Fuchida heard about the Nagasaki bombing from Yano. Again, he urged the utmost speed in appealing to the United States for peace and to world opinion to end the Holocaust. He asked and obtained permission to hurry to Tokyo, for he feared a third atomic bomb, this time on the capital. He wanted to rush his report in person to the Navy Ministry and make them understand exactly the sort of danger Japan was up against. Again, he didn't blame the United States but he did resent the timing of this second bomb. An interval of only three days between the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings was unrealistic. The Japanese government should have been given at least a week after the first atomic bomb to negotiate for the surrender of Japan, Fuchida judged. Three days were not enough. In fact, doubt lingered as to the nature of the weapon. On 10 August, some members of Nishina's group still insisted that the bombs were not atomic, one of these men, an instructor at the Naval Academy, maintained that it was an application of liquid air. By that time, however, this was a minority view. Once again, Fuchida hoped for quick action in high places to take advantage of the opportunity for peace. He had noted how President Roosevelt, immediately following Pearl Harbor, shrewdly seized upon that name as a potent emotional symbol of treachery and dastardliness. He wrung every last drop out of the situation to rally the American people behind the war effort and to muster international opinion on the side of the United States. All of which was fair enough, Fuchida conceded. Now it was Japan's turn. The United States had given Japan a similar chance for propaganda and a means of appealing to the conscience of humanity. The atomic bombs weren't unmitigated disasters if they cut short further senseless slaughter. Not all of Fuchida's reasoning was military and political. Beneath the uniform was a human being who suffered for the misery of his countrymen. An affectionate father, he writhed at the thought of the dead and maimed children. Logic points out that the victims of the Tokyo fire bombings of 9 to 10 March were no less dead than those of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And citizens of Manila and Shanghai, for example, could have had something to say on the subject of inhuman warfare. But from the beginning, something about the atomic bomb transcended logic. U.S. Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson recognised this as early as the 5th of March 1945, when the United States government was up against some very big decisions. Our thoughts went right down to the bottom facts of human nature, morals and government, and it is by far the most searching and important thing that I have had to do since I have been here in the office of the Secretary of War, because it touches matters which are deeper even than the principles of the present government. What roused Fushida to absolute anger and resentment was the Soviet declaration of war against Japan on the 9th of August. This action infuriated him, as the whole savagely fought war with the United States had not. Russia had been waiting for the best opportunity, Fuchida said with disgust. She was ready but never moved until the atomic bomb. The Russians knew that Japan would have to surrender. Everybody was angry with Russia for doing such a cowardly thing. Fuchida's hostility toward communism was born that day. Throughout the long, hard years of the occupation, it saved him from the blandishment of Japan's native communists. Therefore, he was in a receptive mood the next day, 10 August 1945, when his old friend of post-midway days at Yokosuka, Rear Admiral Yokoi, now Ugaki's chief of staff, telephoned him from Kanoya. I favour surrendering to the United States, but not to the Soviet Union. Yokoi told Fuchida, his voice tight with passion. 
I suggest we gather all our remaining air forces and send them against Vladivostok or wherever we can find enough Russians. This mission will be without any hope of victory. It will demonstrate to the whole world in behalf of our people their hatred and disgust at Russia's perfidy. That is exactly my idea too, Fuchida replied. We need no more forces against the United States. We should turn all our remaining strength against the Russians. I will immediately draft an order to attack Vladivostok and take it to Ozawa for signature. Thus, Fuchida abandoned Operation Ken. Hurriedly, he prepared an order for all naval air forces to attack Vladivostok, but in putting this through channels to Ozawa, he ran into an unexpected snag. Yano firmly put his foot down. No more active operations, he declared, and added, please come back to headquarters immediately. So it happened that in the space of a few days, Fuchida had no less than four escapes from death. First, Yano pulled him out of Hiroshima on the eve of the atomic explosion. Then the Russian move cancelled his suicidal Operation Ken. Next, Yano ruled out the protest strike on Vladivostok, which undoubtedly would have been fatal for the participants. The fourth was, in Fuchida's eyes, the most miraculous of all. Shortly after his investigating team left Hiroshima, they began, one by one, to sicken and die. When the pattern became apparent, the Navy ordered Fuchida hospitalized for a thorough examination. This revealed that despite three days of walking over and rooting through the radioactive rubble of Hiroshima, he was completely normal. The doctors had no time to seek a reason why Fuchida should be immune when his teammates were not. They were too concerned with those who needed help. They merely said, there is nothing wrong with you, and turned him loose. Fuchida estimated that some 70 men, in addition to him, were involved in the various investigations at Hiroshima. He was under the impression that all of them had died as the result. This was not exactly the case. For example, his friend from China days, Masatake Okumiya, emerged from the investigations hale and hearty. Nevertheless, enough of Fuchida's colleagues did perish of what the Japanese came to call Genbaku Sho, atom bomb disease, that he considered his survival nothing less than miraculous. His hopes of blasting Soviet territory squelched. Fuchida flew back to Atsugi Air Base late that afternoon, 10 August. There, Captain Yasuna Kozono, who had preceded him by one year at Etajima, lay in wait. After the briefest of greetings, he burst out, In no case will I accept any order to lay down my arms. I will kill you if you agree to surrender, because two thousand kamikaze pilots are already dead from serving under your plan. How can you justify living with this knowledge? This hysterical outburst took Fuchida completely aback. He replied stiffly, you may do as you please about this matter, but I shall also do as I please. Then he smiled and clapped Kozono on the shoulder. Take good care of my plane, and kindly arrange for a car to take me to Tokyo. This matter-of-fact manner seemed to soothe Kozono. He called the motor pool and sent Fuchida off to Navy headquarters at Hiyoshi, a two-hour trip. Upon his arrival, Yano informed him that the Supreme War Council was at that very moment considering the problem of surrender. The problem of surrender had been under discussion for some time in a dramatic series of high-level meetings. To backtrack, early in the morning of 27 July, Japanese monitoring stations had picked up a broadcast from San Francisco giving the text of the Potsdam Declaration, which specified Allied terms of surrender. Japanese sovereignty would be limited to the home islands. Japan would be demilitarized. Certain points in Japanese territory should be occupied. Stern justice should be meted out to war criminals, and the government should remove all obstacles to the revival and strengthening of democratic tendencies among the Japanese people. To the officials in the Japanese Foreign Office carefully analysing the document, two items were highly significant. First, the Soviet Union was not a signatory, and had thereby maintained legal neutrality. Tokyo was attempting to persuade Moscow to act as a peace intermediary, and the declaration did not close the door. Second, whereas the Cairo Declaration had demanded the unconditional surrender of Japan, the Potsdam Declaration called for the unconditional surrender of all the Japanese armed forces. From the Japanese standpoint, the worst thing about the declaration was its failure to specify the continuation of the imperial dynasty. However, Foreign Minister Shigenori Togo thought that the terms were the best Japan could hope for. 
but it would be inadvisable to accept them immediately without trying to interpret them to Japan's best advantage. Therefore, he wanted to withhold action pending the results of the Japanese approaches to Moscow. Predictably, Toyoda, General Yoshijiro Umezu, Chief of the Army General Staff and War Minister General Korechika Anami urged prompt rejection. Finally, all decided on a compromise. The declaration would be published with no official comment. Even so, the military insisted upon deletion of such humane terminology as the promise that the demilitarized troops would be permitted to return to their homes with the opportunity to lead peaceful and productive lives. We do not intend that the Japanese shall be enslaved as a race or destroyed as a nation. Even the military's toughened version seemed to many war-weary Japanese to be unexpectedly lenient. A number of citizens urged Togo to have the government accept immediately. Meanwhile, the Navy Ministry sent out an instruction to its forces because it had to check the effects of the proclamation on frontline morale. This aroused Ugaki to a comment all too typical of the armed forces' blind arrogance. The Navy Minister issued a statement in which he urged the whole Navy to do its best without being bothered by such a thing. He had better not issue such a weak instruction, but instead send a recommendation asking those three countries for an unconditional surrender. Unfortunately for Japan, on 28 July, under pressure from the High Command, Suzuki issued an official statement that the proclamation would be ignored and the nation would continue to wage war. In the delicate phraseology of diplomacy, there was a vast difference between deciding to ignore something and announcing officially that one is ignoring it. To all intents and purposes, by indirection the army and navy had secured the rejection they wanted. Washington so interpreted Suzuki's remarks, and the result was the horror of Hiroshima. Following that, early in the morning of the 9th of August, Domi intercepted the TASS announcement of the Soviet declaration of war. This effectively killed any hope of Russian mediation. Suzuki phoned the chairman of the Cabinet Planning Bureau, Sumihisa Ikeda, who had been in Manchuria until that July. Is the Kwantung army capable of repulsing the Soviet army? He inquired. The Kwantung army is hopeless, replied Ikeda bluntly. Is the Kwantung army that weak? asked Suzuki with a sigh. Then the game is up. At 10.30, Suzuki met at the palace with the Big Six, the Supreme War Direction Council. Togo urged immediate acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration. He reminded his colleagues of the Emperor's words after the Hiroshima bomb. Continuation of the war had become impossible. Soviet Union entry into the war against Japan compounded this truth. They must secure a guarantee of the welfare of the imperial family, but should propose no additional conditions lest the Allies refuse to negotiate further. Everyone agreed that the position of the imperial family and the structure of the state must be guaranteed. That was the only point of unanimity. Yonai supported Togo, but Toyoda, Anami and Umezu wanted to keep on fighting. Spouting the standard clichés, one more campaign, repulse the invaders before they land, we could destroy the major part of an invading army. They insisted upon three additional conditions, that the Allies either eliminate the security occupation of the main Japanese islands entirely, or limit it severely, that Japan alone disarm its troops, and that Japanese tribunals try war criminals. After three hours, the council was deadlocked. Togo, Yonai and, wavering Suzuki versus Anami, Umezu and Toyoda. Sometime in the course of this session, the conferees received word of the Nagasaki bombing. There is no evidence that this event entered into their discussions one way or the other. Perhaps they shared Toyoda's feeling that after Hiroshima, the United States had shot its atomic bolt. He believed that all the radium-like elements in the world would not have amounted to much. This factor would greatly restrict the number of atomic bombs the United States could use over a given period. He also wondered whether the world would permit the United States to continue such an inhuman atrocity. Perhaps the American people would turn away from it. In retrospect, Toyoda considered that the Soviet declaration of war did more to hasten Japan's surrender than the atomic bombings. Fuchida believed that Toyoda was under the influence of Onishi, founder of the Kamikazes, a fire-eating diehard, now vice chief of the naval general staff. Onishi claimed that there were still ample chances of victory. Recalled Vice Admiral Zenshiro Hoshina, 
chief of the Navy Ministry's Bureau of Naval Affairs. It looked as if his vigorous pressure had dominating effects even on the chief of the Naval General Staff, to speak nothing of his subordinates. A cabinet meeting held on the 9th of August, shortly after the War Council adjourned, proved to be, in Togo's words, a repeat performance of the morning's meeting. This time a majority supported the foreign minister, but the decision required unanimity. At 22.30, Suzuki recessed the weary conferees and with Togo sought audience with the emperor. After Togo gave his majesty a rundown of the situation, Suzuki asked and received permission to convene the Supreme War Direction Council that night in the presence of the emperor. The clock lacked but half an hour of midnight when the council met with a few augmentations, including ex-premier Baron Kichiro Hiranuma, president of the Privy Council, in the sweltering Imperial Air Raid Shelter. This was another replay, if anything more eloquent than the preceding one, for now the speakers had to convince not only their colleagues but also their emperor. The generals were especially forceful. Anami pleaded that the nation proceed resolutely. If all the people go into the final battle resolved to display the utmost patriotism and fight to the last, I believe we can avoid this crisis. Umezu claimed, preparations for the decisive battle of the homeland are already completed, and we are confident of victory. Once more, Togo repeated his arguments. Once more, the lines were drawn. Togo, Yonai and Hiranuma on one side, Anami, Umezu and Toyoda on the other. It was past two on 10 August when Suzuki rose and amid the shocked gasps of those present, approached the throne. Respectfully, he asked that Hirohito express his opinion. He implored his colleagues to accept the imperial decision as final. His Majesty did have an opinion, which he expressed with emotion and no hesitation. Heretofore, the plans of the army and navy authorities have always been erroneous and inopportune. I do not want to see the people continue to suffer any longer. Also, I do not desire any further destruction of culture, nor any additional misfortune for the people of the world. On this occasion, we have to bear the unbearable. I do not have the heart to disarm the loyal military, nor to let my faithful subordinates become war criminals. However, it cannot be helped for the sake of the country. One step remained. Suzuki, armed with the imperial decision, reconvened the recessed cabinet. This time he secured unanimous agreement. Acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration with its provision concerning the imperial family went out early on the 10th. This pleased US War Secretary Stimson, who had wanted the guarantee included in the first place. He told Truman that in his opinion, even if the question hadn't been raised by the Japanese, we would have to continue the Emperor ourselves under our command and supervision in order to get into surrender the many scattered armies of the Japanese who would own no other authority, and that something like this use of the Emperor must be made in order to save us from a score of bloody Iwo Jimas and Okino as all over China and the New Netherlands. Nothing could be done on the diplomatic front until Tokyo received the Allies' reply. Meanwhile, the government faced a task monumental in its scope, hair-trigger in its delicacy. How to condition the nation to accept the idea of surrender after having been exhorted for so long to fight to the death? This was a special problem for the armed forces. Consciousness of the Japanese fighting man was that elemental order, die but never surrender. Sensing restlessness in the Navy, particularly among naval general staff officers, Toyoda ordered them not to make any hasty move or take independent action. At the War Ministry, Anami summoned all officers of the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and above to tell them of the government's decision. He stressed the importance of unity and order and warned against disregarding the decision. Among those present was Anami's brother-in-law, Lieutenant Colonel Masahiko Takeshita. The news of the imperial decision grilled our brains severely, he remembered. Since such a unique national polity as we enjoyed was beyond the understanding of foreign nations, there was little doubt that the occupation forces would eventually compel us to transform it as they wished. It would be useless for the people to survive the war if the structure of the state itself was to be destroyed. Unfortunately, the government sent out mixed signals. The cabinet issued an announcement that Japan's fortunes were now at their lowest ebb, the government would do its utmost to defend the national polity and the honour of the nation, and it expected the Japanese people to overcome all difficulties to uphold our national polity. Cheek by jowl with this statement, newspapers printed the army's instructions to officers and men, 
which called upon them to fight to the end in this holy war for the defence of our divine land. Japan's field commanders had not been taken into the headquarters' confidence. Ugaki first heard that Japan had sued for peace on 11 August, when his chief intelligence officer, a look of horror on his face, brought him the most hateful news after hearing a San Francisco broadcast. At first, Ugaki took this for enemy propaganda, but a telephone call from Hiyoshi disabused him of the notion. He refused to admit that the Navy didn't have enough strength left to continue the conflict. And what about the large army forces still in China and in Japan proper? Ugaki insisted in his diary, even though it became impossible for us to continue an organised resistance after expending strength, we must continue a guerrilla warfare under the Emperor and never give up the war. When this resolution was made firmly, we could not be defeated. Instead, we could make the enemy finally give up the war after making it bitterly taste a prolonged war. In this spirit, on 12 August, Lieutenant Colonel Yoshida, the army liaison officer who had replaced Sejima at Combined Fleet Headquarters, approached Fuchida with a proposition. The two men occupied adjoining desks and had become friendly. Both knew that a number of diehards in the naval air arm were eager to continue fighting. This group comprised in the main junior officers stationed at Kisarazu on Kyushu and at such bases near Tokyo as Yokosuka and Atsugi. The latter two bases contained the most vociferous opponents, particularly Atsugi. There not only the reckless airmen were involved, the base commander himself, Fuchida's volatile friend Kozono, was their ringleader. These men demonstrated under the slogan, Surrender is not the will of the Emperor. They swore to ignore any such order Ozawa might issue, and to fight to the last man. Yoshida sounded Fuchida out. What do you think about surrender? he asked. Impulsively, Fuchida shouted, No, never surrender! This reaction was at total variance with his considered estimate of the situation. He was sick of the war. The roll call of his departed comrades drummed in his ears. The ghosts of Japan's burned-out cities haunted his dreams. Moreover, the concept of a coup d'etat was the sort of melodrama from which he usually shrank in suspicious distaste. But he agreed. Like so many of his countrymen in this period, he wasn't thinking. He was a prey to emotion. If, against Japanese tradition, the government was going to surrender, the emperor's loyal subjects had to remove the government. Such was the rationale of Fuchida and Yoshida. A coup d'etat needed support and weapons. To estimate the possibility of acquiring these, Yoshida went to army headquarters, and Fuchida hurried over to talk with Onishi at Naval General Staff headquarters. He could have chosen no flag officer more likely to pour fuel rather than cold water over the proposal. Onishi was too far gone in his fanatical determination to remember the loyalty he owed his superiors. On the 9th of August, he had entered the council meeting, and ignoring Yonai and Toyoda, called an army out of the room to tell him that the Navy minister was weak-kneed and of no use. Please insist strongly on the continuation of the war, he pleaded. When Yonai found this out, he summoned Onishi and Toyoda and administered such a chewing out that Toyoda stood at attention, stiffened as though he was frozen, and Onishi hung his head low with tears rolling down his face. Fuchida had no difficulty getting in to see Onishi. What does the situation look like at the naval general staff level? he asked. The admiral gave him a brief summary and was more than willing to support a coup. Assured of Onishi's approval, Fuchida flew to Yokosuka. There, the chief flight officer was his Etajima classmate, Captain Hiroshi Kogure. Then he went to Atsugi to see Kozono. He told both men that in case of a coup, they must prepare. Both promised they would be ready when and if called upon. Then he returned to combined fleet headquarters to await developments. They were not long in coming. Throughout that day, 12 August, debates began on whether or not to accept the Allied reply. The Americans had widely varied ideas about the imperial dynasty, and the reply didn't contain the reassurance for which the Japanese hoped. The US position was this. From the moment of surrender, the authority of the emperor and the Japanese government to rule the state shall be subject to the supreme commander of the Allied powers. This left considerable leeway for interpretation. So did the statement, the ultimate form of government of Japan shall, in accordance with the Potsdam Declaration, be established by the freely expressed will of the Japanese people. 
Togo felt that this, in effect, guaranteed the survival of the emperor system. Those who knew the Japanese people could have no doubt that they would wish to retain the ancient dynasty. This interpretation and his assurance of Hirohito's support were the twin sources of strength enabling Togo to endure the next two days. He had to fight off even more determined resistance than before, if that were possible. This time Hironuma ranged himself with the opposition, and Suzuki came perilously near to submitting to army pressure. It took Kido's intervention to bring him back into the fold. An army ranged far out of the channels of protocol in a desperate attempt to secure imperial support for his position. He visited Prince Mikasa, the emperor's third brother, an army officer, to ask him to change the emperor's mind so as to continue the war. His highness told him off. Since the Manchurian incident, the army has not once acted in accordance with the imperial wish. It is most improper that you should still want to continue the war when things have come to this stage. Umezu tried higher. He and Toyoda had an audience with the Emperor to beg him to reject the Allied reply. This earned Toyoda another stern reprimand from Yonai for daring to take such a step without consulting him. The afternoon of 13 August found Fuchida hastening off to plan with Onishi the seizure of the palace and the government, along with army and navy headquarters. According to the tentative plan, a general would be the new premier and power would rest largely in army hands. In a hallway of Naval General Staff Headquarters, Fuchida encountered Prince Takamatsu. Just a minute, the prince said abruptly, and motioned him into a nearby small room. He followed reluctantly. I was in a hurry to meet Onishi, he recalled, and the coup d'etat was so near. But one could not brush off an imperial prince, especially if he happened to be a superior officer and Etajima classmate. With his high, broad cheekbones, pointed chin and taut features, Prince Takamatsu resembled a fine Siamese cat, and he had that feline's disconcerting gaze. Under the spell of those dark eyes, Fuchida began to feel uncomfortable. Suddenly, he was sure that the prince knew about the plan and Fuchida's part in it. His words left no doubt. I have just returned from the palace where I spoke with His Imperial Majesty personally. The Emperor most earnestly desires to surrender immediately, and thus secure peace for the nation. For Fuchida, those few words changed everything. Little remained to give his life meaning but fulfilling the imperial will. All right, he replied, the coup d'etat will be cancelled. The two men discussed the matter a few minutes longer. The will of the emperor is the key to an orderly transition from war to peace, Fuchida observed. May I request that all members of the royal family in the military service go to the various fronts as imperial messengers? They can perform a national service by convincing our military leaders that surrender is indeed His Imperial Majesty's sincere wish. Whether or not as a result of Fuchida's suggestion, a few days later three princes of the Imperial family did go to the fronts as emissaries to ensure obedience, Prince Yasuhiko Asaka to China, Prince Haruhito Kanin to the south, and Prince Tsunenisa Takeda to the Kwantung army and Korea. Princes Mikasa, Kuni, Takeda and Takamatsu were scheduled to visit various army and naval air units later. By the planned departure date, however, matters had settled down and their trips were unnecessary. As soon as Fuchida left Prince Takamatsu, he telephoned the air bases at Yokosuka and Atsugi. Kogure was willing to call off the coup. Kozono wasn't, being much too bitter to listen to reason. Next, Fuchida tried to find Yoshida, but he had left Navy headquarters to join his army group. Fuchida never saw him again. Then, in furious haste, he started writing a brief pamphlet, We Believe This, for distribution to all naval aviators. In five pages, he laid down his point of view. The Navy had fought its best for four years, and had nothing with which to reproach itself. Surrender was the will of the Emperor. For this statement, he had the authority and word of His Majesty's brother, the Navy's own Prince Takamatsu. So, he wrote, I believe this is the truth. Without troubling about literary flourishes, Fuchida hurried it off for immediate publication and distribution as his small contribution to law and order. His airmen might listen to him, whereas the words of high command or government would go in one ear and out the other. Fuchida had promised Prince Takamatsu more than he could deliver. On the night of 13 August, Onishi came to the Premier's official residence where Togo was meeting with Umezu and Toyoda, and asked to speak to them. Togo related the incident. 
He contended that the problem in question was not that the Allied reply was unsatisfactory. The need, he felt, was rather for the military to formulate a plan for certain victory, submit it to the Emperor, and then proceed to carry it through. He strongly urged the two chiefs of staff to adopt this course, arguing that we would never be defeated if we were prepared to sacrifice 20 million Japanese lives in a special attack effort. This horrifying suggestion did not recommend itself to Togo, and the last series of arguments continued through the next day, 14 August. By this time, the only cabinet holdout was Anami. He had a potent weapon at his disposal, resignation, which would have brought down the Suzuki cabinet. To his credit, he didn't resign. Out of office, he would no longer have access to the emperor, whom he not only revered as a sovereign but also liked as an individual. The final conference on the subject of surrender was held on the morning of 14 August, again in the Imperial Air Raid Shelter in the presence of the Emperor. After one more plea on the part of Anami, Umezu and Toyoda, Hirohito delivered his verdict in a voice shaking with emotion. The war must cease now before the nation suffered extermination. Weeping attendants withdrew to prepare an Imperial rescript announcing the decision. That night, at about 22.50, the Emperor recorded a speech to be delivered to the nation at noon the next day. Japan would surrender, effective 23, 14 August 1945. The recording became the focal point of what remained of the rebellious faction. They would steal it before the broadcast. That night a number of army officers descended on the palace. When the commander of the palace guards refused to join them, they killed him and his aide. By means of a forged order, they convinced the rest of the guards to let them search the premises. The guards joined them and sealed off the palace. A blackout being in force, they rummaged by flashlight to no avail. They couldn't find the recording. A telephone line leading to Navy headquarters remained open, and through it an appeal for help reached the outside. The searchers were still combing the palace early on 15 August when Lieutenant General Shizuichi Tanaka commanding the Eastern District and 12th Area Armies, drove into the grounds and restored order. That day and night saw the beginning of a steady stream of suicides, among them Onishi and Anami. Yoshida killed himself at army headquarters. Had Fuchida continued to be caught up with the rebels, honour and custom would have demanded his own self-destruction. He owed a debt of gratitude to Prince Takamatsu for taking him into his confidence and thus indirectly saving his life. Shortly before noon on 15 August, Ozawa gathered all the officers and men of combined fleet headquarters on the grounds behind the building. There he lined them up in parade review to hear the Imperial broadcast. The citizens of Japan didn't know they would hear the Emperor's voice. The press release only notified everyone to listen to a broadcast at 12. A few seconds before noon, Ozawa called them to attention. The announcer revealed that the speaker would be His Imperial Majesty. At the first sound of the Emperor's voice, each of the officers at Navy headquarters saluted smartly, remaining at attention until the end of the broadcast, at which time they saluted again. Underneath their rigid military bearing, every man present grieved for his Emperor, placed in such a humiliating position. Fuchida found himself wondering if the outcome of the war would have been different had he fought harder. Fuchida listened with more than ceremonial attention, one point disturbed him. About halfway through the speech, a phrase was spoken that would play over and over in his thoughts, to pave the way for a grand peace for all generations to come. Fuchida didn't understand the concept. How could human beings establish a permanent peace? The idea flew in the face of history. Man could not achieve perfection, hence there would always be wars. At that moment he wanted peace so that Japan could rebuild, when the time was ripe, the nation could wage war again, shining with imperial radiance. With such thoughts in mind, he couldn't help wondering if this phrase represented the emperor's conviction, or whether he wasn't, as the Japanese expression has it, a man who brings to his execution a sweet-sounding gong. During the ceremony, Fuchida observed Ozawa closely. The admiral's stoic face usually kept its secrets, but so disheartened did he appear that Fuchida worried lest he be tempted to suicide. He decided to stick close by Ozawa. After the broadcast, when Ozawa and his officers had tea together, Fuchida's fears were allayed. They discussed Ugaki's suicide. 
He had taken off that day from Kyushu with a volunteer crew on the last kamikaze mission. Some present declared that Ugaki had fulfilled his responsibility as an admiral, having sent so many to their deaths under his orders. Fuchida took exception to this idea. If Ugaki wanted to kill himself, that was his business, he said firmly, but he had no right to ask for volunteers to go along with him. Furthermore, it was his duty to listen to His Majesty's broadcast and to obey whatever wishes he expressed. Then he drove home another point. We fought the war according to the will of the Emperor. I have killed and been injured following the Imperial policy. Now I will accept surrender in the same spirit of loyalty. We must carry out the surrender in good faith and to the letter. We must withhold nothing, not one sword, not one gun, not one dagger. Watching Ozawa, he was satisfied that the Admiral would live, facing the future like a man. Fuchida himself never considered suicide. Professionally, his conscience was clear. He recognised his momentary doubt during the Emperor's broadcast for what it was, an emotional reflex response to a dramatic moment. He had carried out his duty to the best of his ability, and had asked no man to do what he did not stand ready to do himself. He had been scrupulously loyal to superiors and subordinates alike. Very much a son of his nation and his time, Fuchida believed that in certain circumstances suicide was honourable. But under the present conditions, Japan had corpses enough and to spare. Fuchida wanted to live on for his country, his emperor and his family. After the abortive coup, troops from outside the Tokyo area were rushed in to replace the palace guard, which could no longer be considered reliable. A replacement platoon from Ibaraki Prefecture revolted and seized Ueno Hill, but shortly was persuaded to disperse. The young officers who had led the revolt committed suicide. Another group occupied Atagi Hill. Soon thereafter, the entire group blew themselves up with hand grenades. Fuchida realised the extent and nature of the resistance when he made arrangements for the flight of Japan's peace delegates to Manila. MacArthur had stipulated that the delegates fly from Haneda to Kisarazu, thence to Okinawa in two planes painted white and marked with a green cross on the wings and body. At Okinawa, the delegates would transfer to US aircraft. Ozawa authorised Fuchida to secure a Douglas DC from Yokosuka for the first leg. But when Fuchida phoned the order to Captain Kogure, he refused to comply. The Yokosuka anti-surrender group has agreed to work with Kozono at Atsugi, in establishing a picket line in the air across Japan between the two bases to shoot down any surrender plane that tries to fly to Okinawa, he said. Fuchida sizzled with wrath at Kogure and Kozono, both old enough to know better. But he felt sorry for the rebel pilots. He understood how difficult it was for youth to accept defeat. These young men sincerely believed that venal politicians had coerced the emperor into surrender and that they alone followed the wishes of his heart. Kozono was the key to the problem, which surprised Fuchida not at all. This thin-faced, determined man was dedicated to the proposition that the average man is a fool, and the majority always wrong. Even at Etajima he was convinced that he knew all the answers. He always insisted on his own way, reminisced Fuchida. Oh, the trouble he caused sometimes. No one could question his bravery, for he was a fearless fighter pilot, with all, he could be a delightful companion, in token of which his friends nicknamed him Anchon, good guy. Refusing to accept surrender, Kozono sent his Atsugi aircraft buzzing over Yokosuka, possibly as a hint to Kogure to tow the line. He also had his flyers dropping bills all over Tokyo, fulminating against capitulation. Don't surrender. Don't believe the Imperial rescript. It is a false document. He went on the Atsugi radio and broadcasted messages protesting the surrender. Neither he nor his officers, he proclaimed, would obey any order from the supreme command to lay down their arms. He added that nothing could convince him that surrender was the emperor's will. The situation at Atsugi was so potentially dangerous that the emperor was greatly worried that Japan would lose the faith of the world if something should go wrong when the occupation forces arrived. A good three million men were armed in the home islands, and at least that many overseas. Ozawa feared that the popular firebrand Kozono would ignite the entire service. Vice Admiral Biritaro Totsuka, the commander at Yokosuka, was understandably nervous about Kozono's aircraft circling over his base. 
He telephoned Ozawa to ask if he could send a detachment of marines to Atsugi and put Kozono under arrest. Ozawa held the phone and relayed the request to Fuchida. What about it? he whispered. Fuchida shook his head vigorously. It could mean civil war. Ozawa nodded agreement. Let's hold off for a while, he advised Totsuka. While the two admirals talked, Fuchida thought the matter over. This looked like his problem. Kozono was a close personal friend, and Atsugi a naval airbase. As air officer of the combined fleet, I will go to Atsugi and talk to Kozono, he declared. With Ozawa's permission, Fuchida ordered a staff car, and alone, save for his enlisted driver, set out for Atsugi, taking with him his sword and a loaded pistol. On the way, he reviewed his strategy. First, he would try to get it through Kozono's obstinate head that the Emperor wanted Japan to surrender. If Kozono remained unconvinced, which was all too probable, Fuchida would have to resort to his sword. Fuchida liked Kozono, and didn't relish the prospect of killing him, but his revolt could spark nationwide rebellion. Of course, he told himself, Kozono will be armed also, and will stab back at me with equal goodwill. From Kozono's point of view, he had reason to be upset with Fuchida. One day the latter had stood by him, the next he had made a 180-degree turn and authored a tract saying that surrender was the imperial will. Kozono might well be thinking that Fuchida was vacillating, or shirking his higher duty. As Fuchida's car came within sight of Atsugi's main gate, he blinked in surprise. Machine guns ringed the base and sailors wearing combat helmets stood guard with fixed bayonets at the closed gates. Evidently, Kozono, having heard rumours about a contemplated marine attack, was prepared to go down fighting. Fuchida instructed his driver to stop, left the car and approached the gate, calling for the chief of the guard. To this man, a petty officer, he introduced himself. I am the air operations officer of the combined fleet, Captain Mitsuo Fuchida. The chief snapped to salute and replied, Yes, sir, I know you. I have come to meet with the commanding officer, Captain Yasuna Kozono, but before you tell him I'm here, open the gates and let me drive to his headquarters. Fuchida feared that if Kozono learned of his arrival, he might refuse him entrance. The fact that the guard knew him by sight and reputation was a piece of luck. Without further ado, the petty officer signalled his men to open the gate. Thankfully, Fuchida re-entered the car for the five-minute drive to Kozono's headquarters. There he met another acquaintance of former years, Lieutenant Commander Toshio Hashizumi, the base air operations officer and Kozono's second-in-command. Hashizumi recognised Fuchida at once, for they had seen considerable pre-war service together. He saluted. What can I do for you, sir? I've come to see Captain Kozono, Fuchida replied. What are the prospects? Hashizumi's face clouded over. Kozono has been drinking heavily, he admitted. I'm afraid that he's losing his mind. Fuchida was relieved. Up to that moment he hadn't known exactly how to go about his mission, for it appeared that his friend was doomed no matter what course he took. If he refused to give up his rebellion, Fuchida would have to kill him. But if he surrendered, he faced court-martial and perhaps a firing squad. With Hashizumi's words, Fuchida saw a pattern of action that would save all faces and lives. It required Hashizumi's cooperation. Looking the unhappy officer squarely in the eye, Fuchida said, Under the circumstances, are you with me or are you against me? Hashizumi didn't flinch. I'm with you, he replied. Fuchida nodded his satisfaction. What I have in mind, he explained, is to overpower Kozono and get him to a hospital. If the doctors declare him insane, the Navy cannot hold him responsible for his conduct. And if the rest of your officers and men understand that their commander is mentally ill, they can lay down their arms honourably with no feeling of disloyalty or disobedience, order an ambulance to report at once in front of headquarters. Hashizumi did so. Then together he and Fuchida hastened to Kozono's private quarters, an office and a bedroom on the second floor near the main entrance. Fuchida burst in through the bedroom door and beheld Kozono in full uniform, sitting beside a table methodically drinking sake. Although well under the influence, he recognised his visitor at once. Oddly enough, he had been reading Fuchida's pamphlet. With a roar, he leapt to his feet. Kozono had always had difficulty speaking, pulling his words out like olives from a bottle. Fuchida, you have betrayed us, 
he spluttered, and surrender is not a word in the dictionary of our country. He snatched up the booklet from the table and ripped it in two under Fuchida's nose, yelling furiously, This is only your opinion. It is not the will of the emperor. You must be killed. And he clapped his hand to his sword hilt. As Kozono struggled in his drunken mist to pull the sword from its scabbard, Fuchida grabbed him by the elbows. Help me, he shouted to Hashizumi. Whereupon that man rushed forward, seized Kozono around the legs, and with Fuchida wrestled him to the floor. Kozono struggled and screamed as four sailors from the ambulance arrived. They forced him into a straitjacket and bore him, stretched stiff as a plank and howling at the top of his lungs, to the waiting ambulance. Then the vehicle sped off for the hospital at Yokosuka. Fuchida telephoned Yano to give him a quick account of events. Please get in touch with Admiral Totsuko immediately, he said, and have Kozono committed to the psycho ward at Yokosuka. May I suggest that I be made temporary commander at Atsugi? That will give me authority to restore the base to normal. Within two hours, he received the necessary orders. At thirteen, he summoned all officers and men of Atsugi to report in front of the headquarters building for a general assembly. Over one hundred officers and three thousand enlisted men had gathered when Hashizumi climbed onto a platform and introduced the new commander. Fuchida stepped forward and announced that he was taking over command of the base. Then he issued his first order. All preparations for fighting must cease. All machine guns must be removed. All propellers taken off all airplanes. All weapons turned in. Much grumbling ensued. Most of the young men had been enjoying the atmosphere of drama, but in the end they obeyed, except for eighteen fighter pilots, all inexperienced and little more than boys. A day or so later they climbed into their planes, took off and headed for army air bases in Saitama Prefecture where they hoped to find support. It was not forthcoming, and they surrendered on 25 August. By way of postscript, the pilots were tried for their mutiny and received from two to four years in prison. Kozono recovered his sanity quite soon. A civil court tried him for disobedience to military law and handed down a sentence of 13 years imprisonment, which Fuchida considered a severe penalty imposed to placate the occupation. Kozono went free after serving seven years. He bore Fuchida no grudge for clapping him into a straitjacket. However, he remained convinced that Japan should have resorted to guerrilla resistance and retained his political views, which were somewhat to the right of the late Dowager Empress of China. As soon as Atsugi was secured, Fuchida was relieved as commander. But he was present on the afternoon of 30 August when MacArthur landed there. Commander Tarai, a member of the surrender delegation to Manila, had informed Fuchida that MacArthur chose Atsugi as his landing site against his, Tarai's advice and that of Captain Omai. Tarai informed certain of MacArthur's officers that Atsugi was dangerous. This was an honest attempt to avoid trouble but poor psychology in dealing with MacArthur. Though Fuchida didn't serve on the welcoming committee, he got a good look at MacArthur. He admitted to prejudice against the general, sight unseen, not because he came as Japan's conqueror, but because he had abandoned his men on Bataan. No Japanese supreme commander ever fled, leaving his troops and officers. This is not the Japanese tradition, explained Fuchida. I shall return. That was okay, but not leaving his troops. I didn't like that. His first sight reinforced his bias. Fuchida described the scene. MacArthur walked proudly, his head high, he shook hands with a U.S. general on the ground. I don't know who. His hat was on one side and he wore sunglasses. He smoked a big pipe, but he paid no attention to the Japanese delegation, standing straight and saluting him. I thought to myself, much too proud. Almost immediately, Fuchida returned to headquarters at Tokyo. At last he could turn his attention to burning classified materials. The senior staff officer, Captain Yamaoka, had ordered this at Ozawa's direction on 14 August. The items to be burned consisted of all the Navy's top secret, secret and confidential documents, a monumental task that consumed three entire days and nights. The papers, stored at Yokosuka, had to be trucked to combined fleet headquarters for destruction. Fuchida didn't openly object to this procedure, but it did seem like wanton destruction to him. Japan had no more secrets to keep, why should Ozawa and Yamaoka insist upon the letter of security? Someday, this information would be important. 
Future historians had the right to be able to say to their generations, this is how it was. Impelled by instincts he could scarcely recognize or define, he set about securing one copy of each important document pertaining to the war, especially those dealing with Pearl Harbor and Midway. Later, he put this collection into six large aluminum containers and buried them in an underground shelter in his garden at Kashiwara. Soon, combined fleet headquarters began to receive orders for representatives to report to MacArthur's temporary headquarters in Yokosuka. There, they would receive instructions concerning the forthcoming surrender ceremonies aboard the battleship Missouri. One of these problems was arranging for a Japanese pilot to bring the Missouri in safely. With Tokyo Bay heavily mined, only an experienced bay pilot could thread through the channel. MacArthur ordered the airbases around Tokyo cleared out and prepared for occupation forces. Fuchida made the two-hour train trip to Tateyama, some 70 miles south of Tokyo at the tip of the Boso Peninsula, to remove military personnel from the base there. Likewise, he prepared and inventoried all weapons and aircraft for turnover. By the time he finished, the base was secure, with only 20 or 30 administrative personnel remaining. He waited at the pier on Tateyama Bay to greet the new American commanding officer and turn the base over. He expected the ships to pull up at the pier and unload their troops as at any commercial port. Instead, they dropped anchor some distance out and disgorged about 24 small boats full of grim-looking combat-ready marines. The boats ran up on shore, then the marines jumped into the bay and waded to land with rifles ready. They're getting all wet, Fuchida thought in amazement, and it isn't necessary. Evidently, the Americans felt they might have to fight their way in. When the Marines discovered they had no enemy to contend with, they subsided, slightly deflated, and gazed curiously about. Then their commanding officer appeared walking down the pier from the land side. He had jumped into water up to his chest and was practically wrapped up in grenades. Fuchida swallowed his amusement and addressed him in halting English. Is this your manoeuvre? No, the colonel replied. This is a genuine operation. Saying no more, Fuchida accompanied him and the Japanese base commander to the headquarters building for private surrender ceremonies. As soon as he decently could, he slipped away. Despite his amusement at their full-scale landing operation against a score of clerks, he was sorry for the drenched troops. They were squelching about in their heavy combat boots and shivering from the chilly waters. Tateyama boasted a huge bathhouse that could accommodate a hundred men at a time. Fuchida suggested they have hot baths while their clothes dried. The men appreciated the gesture and soon recovered in steaming, relaxed comfort. These preliminaries led up to the climax on the morning of the 2nd of September, the formal surrender aboard the Missouri. Fuchida prepared transportation for the Japanese delegation, but the launches he secured proved unnecessary. An American destroyer carried the official party to the battleship, Several liaison officers, army and navy, went out in a big, beautiful launch assigned to the Yokosuka commander. Fuchida was among them. These men ranked too far down the echelon to rate a position on the surrender deck, but he could see the ceremony clearly from an upper deck. By this time, Fuchida had been through so much, four years in the thick of a fiercely fought war, seeing his dearest friends whirled away one by one into the vortex of death, enduring the slow, inexorable approach of defeat, treading the blasted streets of Hiroshima, assisting in the mechanics of capitulation. Such excitement, such tension, such horror, such grief, that by now he had attained a curious sort of detachment. He surveyed the scene with intense interest. An almost mystical sensation of witnessing a historical turning point enveloped him. The ceremony itself wasn't unduly humiliating. Fuchida was honest enough to admit that if the Japanese had won, they would have made a big production out of the surrender. He found one aspect ironic. At the time, I believed Japan had been beaten by the U.S. Navy, not the U.S. Army, he explained. It was the same with Japan. Our army never fought much against the U.S. Army. The Pacific War was mostly a naval war, but at the end of the war, all the political matters were handled by the two armies, Japanese and American. Still, the surrender arrangement had a certain grim justice. The army had been the prime mover in Japan's drive for the conquest of Asia, constantly beating the drums of military glory and racial supremacy. The army had controlled one government after another, moving ever nearer all-out war with the Allies. Perhaps it was only right that it should endure the major ceremonial shame. 
Fuchida observed MacArthur with special interest, impressed by the atmosphere of a show well stage-managed. This was MacArthur's moment of moments, and he dominated the proceedings with the chill glitter of a diamond. Frankly, remarked Fushida, MacArthur was stiff and yet so proud and full of dignity. I respected him as a brilliant soldier, but I had no feeling for him. He was too cold and distant. A man like Eisenhower I could feel some warmth for, but not MacArthur. Fuchida looked behind MacArthur, seeking the man who in his opinion had really beaten the Japanese. Yes, there he was, Admiral Nimitz in his summer khakis. He looked serious, as befitted the occasion, but lines of good humour and kindness were etched on his face. I was greatly impressed by Admiral Nimitz, said Fuchida. Mamoru Shigemitsu, Japan's new foreign minister and head of the Japanese delegation, came forward to sign the surrender document. He had a wooden leg and used a cane. Prolonged standing or moving about pained him, and he seemed to grope for his place. Nimitz's face softened with sympathy for the crippled statesman. Fuchida saw this. Such a big man and yet so humble, he thought approvingly. Umezu, who had fought surrender to the last ditch, signed for both the Japanese armed forces. As he did so, one of the Chinese delegates hissed loudly and triumphantly. The US delegates didn't like this impolite gesture from the expression on their faces, Fuchida recalled. Next, the Allies came forward. At 9-8, MacArthur, the Supreme Commander for the Allied Powers, signed for all nations. General Arthur Percival of Singapore and Lieutenant General Jonathan Wainwright of Bataan stood beside him. MacArthur signed his name in sections, using several pens. He gave one to Wainwright, one to Percival, and reserved a few. When Admiral Nimitz stepped to the table, accompanied by his war plans officer, Rear Admiral Forrest P. Sherman, and the redoubtable Halsey, he made no such theatrical gesture. He took his own pen out of his pocket and carefully wiped it with a piece of paper so as not to blot the historic document. A great gentleman, Fuchida thought. If Japan had won the war, and if I were signing that document for Japan against the United States, I would sign like Nimitz. Before signing, MacArthur had delivered a brief speech. Throughout the ceremony, Fuchida reflected on his words. An eloquent, if somewhat baroque speaker, even with his limited English, Fuchida could recognise this, he talked of the restoration of peace and a world of freedom, tolerance and justice. Who's justice? Fuchida wondered. The Japanese thought they had justice on their side, too. Japanese justice collided with American justice, and neither of them won. Superior power won. MacArthur ended the ceremony with these words. Let us pray that peace be now restored to the world, and that God will preserve it always. These proceedings are now closed. Fuchida listened sceptically. He had doubted his own emperor when he spoke of everlasting peace, and he didn't believe the general now. No, he thought. You are wrong, MacArthur. Peace isn't coming to the world. More trouble is coming. For Japanese ex-officers, it was a time of trial and tribulation. Defeat and unconditional surrender came as traumatic shocks. A sense of individual responsibility gnawed at many. Moreover, their personal dislocation was abrupt and complete. Before and during the war, their lives had been mapped out for them, a routine of hard work, strict discipline and serious responsibility, but also security, dedication and companionship. Now events turned them loose. The economy was broken. They had neither jobs nor prospects. Small wonder many resorted to irrational activity, things they would never consider under normal circumstances, from black marketing to murder. Some followed the Pied Piper of Moscow. Fuchida heard Japanese communist agitators for the first time in late September or early October, while passing Hibiya Park in Tokyo. They screamed that the war had never touched Hirohito, yet Japanese died for him. Down with the emperor, they yelled. Early in the occupation, MacArthur emptied Japan's jails of political prisoners. Many had been imprisoned for speaking out against the government's expansionist policy, in the belief that along that path lay ruin but many others were active communists. As soon as the prison gates swung open, swarms descended on the palace to demonstrate. Among other things, they demanded to know who fed the emperor, when the whole country was poverty-stricken and food scarce. Fuchida had no use for the Soviet Union after its belated entry into the Pacific conflict. 
To hear his imperial majesty insulted convinced him that the homegrown communists deserved the same contempt as their Russian masters. A month or so after the surrender ceremonies, Gender came to Tokyo to discuss with Fuchida the matter of the imperial family's safety. He had organized a number of officers to protect the imperial family with their lives. We want to protect the entire imperial family if possible, he explained, but if not, we should at least protect Princess Suganomiya. She's only three years old, and we could hide her for ten or even fifteen years until the danger is over. Then we'll bring her out of hiding and restore the royal bloodline. I don't believe the family's in any danger, Fuchida replied, but it's a good idea to have your organization around in case we ever need it. Then Genda showed Fuchida the membership list, which became known as Genda Kikan, Genda's organization. Fuchida didn't add his name, but he assured his friend of support if the need arose. Shortly before this encounter, Fuchida received orders to report to Kur Hospital for examination in connection with his experience at Hiroshima. At least 50 officers in the hospital were suffering from radiation. Most of them had investigated the disaster. Three of the patients had been in Hiroshima when the bomb exploded, the two partially protected by their beds in the Yamato Hotel and Lieutenant Hashimoto. All three expected to die soon. Everyone knew they were doomed. But it was a terrible thing, recalled Fuchida, to hear it from the lips of the victims. These men were human relics by then, no more than that, Fuchida said somberly. They had lost all their energy, and they could barely speak. They were pathetic. There is no other expression for it. He had been pondering the Emperor's words about eternal peace. But until this moment, he couldn't imagine a world where mankind had improved to the point where everlasting accord was possible. Of that, Fuchida had no doubt. Whether or not everlasting peace was possible, the atomic bomb left mankind no choice but to try and achieve it. Looking down at the living remains of his three fellow officers, he said to himself, No more Pearl Harbors. The atomic bomb must never be used again. No more Hiroshimas. No more Nagasakis.